Hello folks, my name's David and welcome to Saving Time. Now this is my better half's 1950s Prim Spider and while not a particularly expensive watch, it is really rare. So as you can see here, it's a small watch and the main problem with it is it just doesn't keep time at all. So as you can see here by the time grapher, it's a little out of whack. Now for people who are new here, I use a lot of macro cameras so this is a shot just to give you a sense of scale. Now this watch would be very difficult for me to replace and it's my better half's favourite watch. So it's vitally important to me and my continued happiness that nothing goes wrong during the restoration of this watch. So I think this one will be nice and clean with no mistakes, but time will tell. Now the watch itself is rather easy to get out of its case. It's got a snapback fitting and a snap-on bezel. Now I have pre-loosened those for cinematic purposes, but as you can see, when we turn the watch over after the back comes off, there's no movement screws in it. That does not bode well for us. It means the last person that was in here didn't even take the time and trouble to put it back together properly. So I'm not surprised at this point that it's not running too well. It is also nearly 70 years old as well, which will have, you know, a deteriorous effect over time that oil will dry up so it needs a good service regardless now the hands come off i use a little piece of paper for this there are actually dial protectors you can get uh, but you know we're a little bit scuff here on saving time now that thing was genuinely wedged into its movement ring whether through oil dirt or just by design i'm not sure but the dial foot screws come out the dial comes off and i'm going to throw that in the little dial box just to protect it, it's the dial that really makes this watch. And it's actually the dial that's the rare component of this watch. The movement itself is somewhat rare being its age, uh, but it's not that difficult to find if you happen to live in the Czech Republic like me. But the dial and case on this one are quite unusual and they are certainly a configuration that you don't normally see. So I'm going to take out the balance cock here that's holding the balance complete. And one of the reasons I do this is I am not a professional watchmaker. This is a hobby of mine. And as I said, I want to be genuinely careful with this one. It's nice to me that my other half likes watches. So I don't want to start off that relationship between her and watches by uh, killing her favorite one. So I'm going to take every precaution I can take here. And that includes taking that out first because that hairspring, as I might have mentioned, is incredibly delicate. I'm also going to want to wind the power out. Now, really bad things can happen when you leave a watch powered and start disassembling it. So the power comes out of the watch there, and I'm going to take off all the components on the top of the barrel bridge. Now, I take the power out of the watch by holding the clip to one side and just putting a screwdriver in the ratchet wheel, which is the wheel that's coming off now, and letting it unwind in a controlled manner. You do not want a a release of a spring that's supposed to power a watch for 40 or 50 hours happening all at once. So the click and click spring come out. Now I'm using a bit of pegwood to hold down the click spring because that will zoom off across the other side of the room where you'll never find it. Now our crown wheel here is reverse threaded. You can tell by the two slots either side of the slot for the screwdriver. But also our ratchet wheel was reverse threaded too, which is a little unusual. I don't think I've ever seen that before. And these screws are identical. So I'm not sure whether that was done as a cost cutting measure, uh, maybe a simplification of logistics on Prim's end, or it's integral to the design of this watch. I don't think so, but it could be wrong. If you're a more experienced watchmaker, go ahead and let me know in the comments. Now, this wheel normally just comes off kind of easily, or this spacer, should I say, normally comes off kind of easily. But in this case, it's thoroughly jammed on there to the fact that you can see the base metal underneath. So it might have been press fit. I'm going to say it was probably press fit. So our barrel bridge is holding down our center wheel. So I'm going to remove the whole bridge just to allow me to access that wheel. Now, that won't come off until we remove the cannon pinion from the other side of the wheel because that wheel is actually press fit via the other side of the watch. But I'll need to get the both the barrel and the train of, wid train of which train of which normally referred to as the train of wheels bridge. If you haven't dropped 100 IQ points when you hit record as you're filming a video. 
So our barrel bridge comes off there, revealing our barrel complete underneath, and this will be the source of power for the watch. That barrel complete will hold the mainspring of the watch, which allows power to be delivered and you to tell the time. Now we're going to take the train of wheels bridge off, and you want to be careful when levering this one off. It contains your third wheel, in this case your fourth wheel, the one that the second hand is connected to, and your escape wheel. And if you lever this one too hard, it's possible to bend those pivots coming through the top of the jewels. And you're going to need to be a far more skilled watchmaker than me to bend those back straight again. So there you can see our center wheel, our third wheel and fourth wheel. And I'm going to take off now the pallet fork, which is connected via the pallet bridge. Uh, or the pallet, pallet cock. It was my understanding that if it has one screw, it's normally referred to as a cock. But being there's so many traditions of watchmaking and so much terminology, I've heard both terms used interchangeably. I'm not actually sure which one is correct. I think it would depend on which school of watchmaking you went to, if I'm being honest. So our escape wheel there tried to escape, but we did find it. Here's our fourth wheel, the one that the second hand is connected to, which is why it has that very long pivot. There is our third wheel and there is our center wheel. Now our center wheel won't actually come off because it's connected via the cannon pinion to the other side of the watch. So you'll need to unfit the cannon pinion for that wheel to drop free. So setting lever screw comes out. The setting lever will oftentimes drop off the bottom of the watch when you do this. So just be sure to keep an eye out for that, or at least I try to. And our sliding and winding pinions can come out. Now they can be under tension which is why that one just shot itself to the other side of the planet Mars. But I did manage to find it. As I said, this watch one, uh, this watch is quite important to me. Um, it would be very difficult to replace. And as a gift, it holds a certain sentimental value. So let's flip over to the dial side and grab that cannon pinion off. Now I'm using a cheap Chinese cannon pinion remover. You'll often see these sold as hand removers. I wouldn't really recommend them. The cheap ones at any rate, the hand levers do a good job and for a much more reasonable price. So as you can see, when our cannon pinion drops off, our center wheel drops out of the other side of the watch. So I'll be sure to pick that up. And now we can turn our attention to the keyless and motion works. So the first thing we'll need to do is remove the cover plate that's holding it all down and also contains sort of an integrated tension bar for the setting jumper, which allows you to jump between winding and setting a watch. Now, everything here is sprung. There's certain tension on it. So you want to be, or at least I try and be a little careful. You'll see here what I mean when that part just also goes for a button. Now, it's ironic, really, that I think I had more parts fly off this watch than has ever happened to me before. And it's the one watch that I really wanted no mistakes to be made on. Um, but, you know, that's the way it goes, right? The, the one thing you need to go right goes absolutely wrong. So the yoke spring comes out. It's a captive spring. The yoke come out and the setting lever before it. And our intermediate setting wheels come out here. Now, there's two on this watch. It's not unusual. It's more likely that you'll see one. This one has two. So both of those intermediate setting wheels came out along with our minute wheel. And just to finish this one off, we have one cap jewel on the bottom that will need to come out because we'll need to oil the other side of that. Uh, so there is our cap jewel being put away. Now I'm going to show you the uh, dial side and the back side of the watch completely stripped. And we can turn our attention to, yep, and there we go. What did I say? This watch, there's something about it that, uh, whether it's just nerves on my part because I want to get this one right, <laughs> Uh, to make someone happy, I don't know, but I'm having problems with that. Anyway, I need to wind the spring out of the barrel in order for it to be cleaned and oiled. And there you can see the various component parts of the barrel and the various component parts here of the entire watch. So I like to put these in an ultrasonic cleaner along with uh, some cleaning agents that I'll go over in a minute for those of you that are interested. But here is all the component parts that go into making this watch. It's a relatively simple watch. Um, it's quite nice. So nice to work on. I mean, now before I put this back into a cleaner or before I put this into a cleaner, uh, I want to make sure that the balance cock there is on. Um, this will just hold that hairspring in one position and not allow it to get tangled or knocked by anything else in the cleaner. So as you can see, I use a bog standard ultrasonic cleaner. No fancy watch tools here just yet. Everything goes into little baskets that go into jam jars. 
And those jam jars are using Elma waterless and uh, rinsing and cleaning agents. Now, I thoroughly recommend those. I'm not affiliated in any way, but they don't melt shellac, which is a problem with cleaning agents like isopropyl. So everything's back from the cleaner. And the first thing I want to do is grease the bottom of my barrel here. This will allow the mainspring to slide around quite freely on that and cause less damage. Now, talking of the mainspring, you will, of course, need to wind it back into shape. I was lucky enough to find some antique watch winders on eBay for a very reasonable price. I think I paid around $100. Uh, watch winders come in sets for various different spring and barrel sizes, arbor sizes. It can actually get quite complicated uh, and they get very, very expensive. A set of Bergeon winders can run you as much as $1,000, even more in some cases. So if you are wanting to try this out for yourself, you don't actually need to buy a set of mainspring winders. You can just buy a brand new mainspring. Uh, they're around 10 to $15, depending on where you source them. So that spring will come wound up. All you do is push it into the barrel. So it's easy to be overwhelmed when you start this as a, as a hobby or maybe even training for it to be a career. Uh, with the sheer amount of tools and things there is to buy and the sheer amount of expense that goes into that. So if you've been looking online for some watch winders to start fixing a watch, you don't need them. Uh, you will eventually, but not to start out, you don't. So give it a go, buy a cheap watch, take it apart. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but there you can see our mainspring has been wound into the tool. That's a bit trickier than I made it look there, but it's really nothing too arduous. Now that's going to press into the barrel. There's a button on the back of the tool that presses the spring into the barrel. This is kind of a, a very um, tricky operation in some regards because it won't always press all the way down and you can end up pulling the tool out and the spring just uncoils all at once, which is bad. So a little bit more grease for the top of the spring that will work its way in as the spring is wound and the arbor and lid have gone on. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get any good shots of that. So I'll just show you the barrel complete there. So the backside and dial side of the watch, I'm going to start on the backside with some oiling. Now, as I've said in videos past, if you've watched me before, I probably won't show every step of the oiling. I'm getting better at showing most of it. Uh, it's just quite tricky to do without heavy magnification. And I generally need to put this under a microscope to do it, which I don't have a camera for. So anyway, I'll try and get as much as possible. So our first wheel or barrel complete goes in. And as I mentioned, there are many traditions of watchmaking, hence the different names. So if you hear a different watchmaker, a different restoration guy, call them different things. They're not necessarily wrong. They might be using slightly different terminology. So I've got our center wheel in there and I'm going to connect in our fourth wheel here, which is the one the second hand is connected to. Our, our hand is actually connected to that center wheel via the cannon pinion, which you saw me remove earlier. Now our intermediate wheel or third wheel is going in. And the reason I put the fourth wheel in before the third one is just I figured it would be easier uh, to do it in this configuration because of the very long pivot on that fourth wheel. And now I can put the escape wheel in, which will allow me to get both the barrel bridge and the train of wheels bridge back on this watch. So there you can see the configuration of wheels from first, second, third, fourth escape. So the barrel bridge is quite easy to fit. Now, I like to get both of the bridges on when I'm screwing the screws down. You'll notice that I don't clamp them ultra tight. You can see here that if I try and move our train of wheels at the moment, uh, they just won't go. And that's because without the barrel bridge on there, without the train of wheels bridge, sorry, there's no pivots to hold them in place. So I'll try and get this train of wheels bridge on the right way up. And before you tighten that down, you want to make sure you can see all your pivots coming through. So you'll see I haven't screwed anything down yet. I genuinely really do want to check that everything is in place, because if you have something that's slightly out of place, a pivot that's not engaged correctly, and you tighten that down as hard as you can, that's just going to bend that pivot. And as I mentioned, unbending pivots is a, is a genuine skill. Like I stand in much admiration of the people that can actually do it, but I have neither the skill or the equipment for it just yet. Hoping to learn as I go along, uh, hoping to get a little better. And now I can go ahead and tighten everything down. Now, as I mentioned at this stage, I'm still not tightening everything as much as I possibly can. I still like to leave a little bit of give on there just in case I've made a mistake, but this seems fine. So onto our 
crown wheel here and I'm going to put a little bit of oil where that um, spacer was press fit on now this is a genuine pain in the backside to get back on uh, and I'm not sure I even needed the oil because the wheel is not spinning I just figured that the lubrication might help it press fit on a little easier so that will eventually go on I'll just put it down with a piece of pegwood and I'm going to actually oil the sides of it here and then I'm going to oil the base of it now what I did notice on watching the video back is I actually oiled the lower base of it I probably should have oiled the top base of it but one of the reasons I do like to video these is, as I said, I'm really just getting started with this, uh, hoping to improve my skill. And the video shows a multitude of sins. Like, the video will show every mistake that you make in glorious detail. But that goes back on. Its screw goes back on, which is actually reverse threaded. As I said, you can tell by the two little stripes down the screw. But just get that on quite quickly. And that wheel, even with the screw on the top, should spin freely. Now, I want to put the pallet fork and pallet bridge back in after I oil that. Now, the reason to put these back in is they will stop the wheels from spinning freely. And when I'm rebuilding the barrel bridge, uh, if I put any power into the watch, it will just immediately unwind. So that's not optimal in this circumstance. So if you put the pallet fork back in, that will actually stop the watch from just immediately unwinding. Now the pallet fork and pallet bridge go in. Again, I did a close-up shot of the pivot coming through the top of that jaw bearing because this is another one you genuinely want to check that it's screwed down now uh, or that it's through before you screw it down sorry now i'm going to use a little bit of plastic over the click spring there just to stop it flying off um, it's very common that it will do so now you can see our click spring is not all the way back where it should be now it's only a small error but that's going to cause me no end of problems towards the end of this build so you'll see that later um, I didn't notice it when I was actually doing it and it was only after having to do some problem solving that I saw that that could have been part of the problem we're going to experience later on and again this was a watch that I really didn't want any problems with so that's a little disappointing but watch the end of the video we managed to sort it out so our crown wheel ratchet wheel and click go on now the click here you can see engaging is acting as a ratchet and clack um, the click is what makes the actual clicking sound of a watch. So with power in the watch, or when you wind the watch, should I say, with power in the watch, you can see our pallet fork just shoots back and forwards nice and easily. So the dial side, I like to put the cannon pinion on before the hour wheel, or before the minute wheel, of course. The hour wheel goes on top of the cannon pinion, so you'd really have to get that on first. And the reason is because that's a press fit you can end up shearing some teeth off your minute wheel if you get the minute wheel in first. So a little bit of grease on our sliding pinion here. That's the teeth that are going to engage with the winding pinion. Now, I use various different lubricants for the springs, the uh, sorry, for the barrel, for the mainspring, for the jewels, for the keyless works, and so on and so forth. Uh, I use a heavier grease type lubricant on the keyless works. Uh, again, it's somewhat something in the Mobius 8000 series. Uh, I can probably list it below in the description for anyone that, that really wants to know. But basically, you use a heavier grease on components with a lot of metal on metal contact, heavier wearing components, and you use lighter synthetic oils on everything else. So a sliding and winding pinion gone in there. I've also thrown back in the crown and winding stem just to stop them from flying about. And I'm going to use a little bit of heavy grease again on the bottom of the yoke. That's going to slide around and engage with the sliding pinion. That's why it's called the sliding pinion. And there you can see those two components engaged. That's going to help the watch go from winding mode to setting mode without a key. Uh, hence the name Keyless Works. Now here is our setting lever. Right now you'll see that interface with the stem. So when I move the stem, the setting lever becomes part of the keyless works connected to our stem there. Now that captive spring is going back in and this honestly was a bit of a nightmare. You would think it would be very easy. It wasn't for whatever reason. Um, nothing on this one has turned out to be super simple, unfortunately, but that spring goes down quite nicely. Now, because it's captive, I'm not using plastic trick on it. I'm just holding it down with a little bit of pegwood. Now, some oil for our intermediate wheels. 
So I do actually oil both sides of those and yep, uh, again with this watch, I don't know, something in the air maybe, but uh, a few mistakes were made, shall we say, but our intermediate setting wheels go back in in the right order, which is probably a good thing. Uh, and as you can see there, those are interfaced together and spin around no problem. Now comes our cover plate with our integrated setting jumper. And I assume that there is a lot of people screaming at me through the camera right now because I haven't put the minute wheel back on and the cover plate actually covers the minute wheel. So that's going to be an issue as well. Uh, fortunately, I do notice that um, it rather glaring error there. So there you go. Our minute wheel was not put in, which can't be put in while that cover plate is on. So we're just going to rewind that whole incident and pretend like it didn't happen. My other half actually does watch these videos. So uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to hide that one. But there we go. Minute wheel goes on and I'll spare you the rebuilding of that whole cover plate exercise. Same as last time, just with all the components underneath it this time. So one of the last things for the dial side of the watch is the cap jewel, and this will be a very light synthetic oil, um, again a Mobius oil, and that tiny, tiny screw there that puts the cap jewel in place. So this watch has been a pleasure to work on despite everything. Um, it's a really nice watch movement and you can pick up, not this particular one, but you can pick up a lot of the prim brand of watches for uh under a hundred dollars certainly maybe even under fifty dollars in some cases so if you want to give the watch repair a go uh pick up one of these now as you can see i have the whole top of the barrel bridge disassembled here because i couldn't actually wind this watch the click was not resetting properly it had other problems so i'm going to rebuild it here and you saw me pull the screw back now you'll also see i've put a signed ratchet wheel on this watch so during the investigation as to what the problem was, I did find that was some small damage to the ratchet wheel. So I managed to source another one that's actually signed. I think it looks nice. And here you can see my keyless works actually now work to both wind and set the watch. So I'll spare you the rebuilding of that. But what I think had happened is some slight damage to the teeth and also that click spring was a bit jammed up. So I need to oil the jewels on the top of the watch and then put the balance cock that's holding the balance complete back in and as you can see that slots in now i'm completely failed on the filming of that one uh, so my apologies but it went back in it starts ticking now by eye the amplitude looks good we'll have to get it on a time grapher of course um, but we're going to screw that back down and you will see this watch on a time grapher presently now i'm quite happy with this rebuild the watch cleaned up really nicely i think my other half will be very pleased or at least i hope she will that she now has a functional clean and watch that should probably run for another 70 years so you can see that beautiful balance tick away there that hairspring going that's actually a breguet over style hairspring uh, i always think those look quite nice even though they are a bit of a pain so our hour wheel goes on into our keyless works interfacing with our minute wheel that was actually in the watch this time our dial goes back on and it's just a case of doing the dial put screws up there and bunging this back in its case now this does fit in front first it's quite easy to do i'm just going to use a gentle bit of pressure push that back in and there you go so really what's left is to get the hands on here get it on a time grapher make sure it works nicely now during my kind of look into what was wrong with this watch. I showed you a time graphing shot that was just snow, and that's what it was most of the time. However, I did get a reading for a brief second, and the B error on this watch was 9.9, .9, uh, which is basically unreadable. My time grapher only goes to 9.9 .9 milliseconds, so I have no idea if I'm going to need to adjust the position of the hairspring on this watch i really don't want to in order to do that you need to reach through the hairspring and adjust the collet that's holding the hairspring it's a very very fiddly operation and the chance of breaking that is extremely high so for me i'm, I'm kind of hoping that i don't have to do that on this one uh, i'm going to put the crystal and bezel back on now this is all just a press fit so i'm going to use a watch press to 
press that back together. Now you can see there is some damage to the crystal, so that will be replaced at some point. I didn't get one in time for the video. I'm going to give you two shots of this watch on a time graph, uh, one at full power and one at half power. Now the results are very, very acceptable, apart from the B error, which requires a very, very delicate maneuver to adjust. So I think I'm just going to let my other half enjoy this one. And I think I'm going to show you some shots of this watch on wrist. It's been a pleasure to work on. It's been very nice talking to all you folks out here in YouTube land again. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If I ever come back and fix the B error, which I'm sure I might at some point, I will make a video on how to do that. But here it is on wrist. Uh, it's been nice talking to you. I very much hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.